6640. 6640. Your future lies in 6640. 66 books by 40 authors, and yet we now discover it's an integrated message system from outside our time domain. Welcome to 6640, the ministry outreach of Koinonia House and Koinonia Institute. Today's Bible teacher is Dr. Chuck Missler, connecting the Bible to your life and the world around you. In today's study, Dr. Missler begins his teaching on the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 6. Well, welcome to session six, studying chapter six of the book of Luke. And again, whenever we enter the word of God, we want to do so with prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, thank you for this book and thank you for this opportunity. We commit this hour into your hands and ourselves. We pray that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and lives to what you have here for us, that we might learn, that we might grow, that we might be more pleasing in your sight as we commit this hour and ourselves, into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen. For anybody that has just joined us, I'd like to review just a little bit to keep ourselves in focus to where we stand here. In chapter 1, of course, we have the annunciations of Mary and, and Elizabeth. And then in chapter 2, we have the birth of Jesus in those early years. And then we had the ministry of chapter 3 of John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus. And we studied the strange family tree of our coming king. And then chapter 4, we just explored the temptations by Satan. And that started a major section called the Galilean ministry. Chapters 4 through 9 is that area. That's where we are now. We later go on towards Jerusalem. And then his final offer, rejection and sacrifice. And of course, the resurrection and ascension as the big climax. But it's we're in this second major section, the Galilean ministry, and we've been through chapter 4 and 5. Uh, the, Jesus began to call his disciples in chapter 5, and, and uh, now we're in chapter 6, challenging the Sabbath we're going to do, and choosing the rest of his apostles. And chapter 7, we'll have some responses, and 8, we'll have a number of very unusual episodes and then chapter 9 will climax with the transfiguration, and that will be this major section. But last time was chapter 5, this time we're looking at chapter 6. So we're continuing to demonstrate that his authority declared in Nazareth in chapter 4 is being validated here. He read from Isaiah chapter 6, which was his mandate. We're seeing that authority that was claimed there being demonstrated with his actions. And so Luke continues to Uh, demonstrate these authority proclaimed there. The Pharisees' attempts to guard the Sabbath further demonstrated how morally impoverished they were dealing with ceremonial issues. It's form over substance. He's He's going to hit that head on. Jesus already alluded to Old Testament prophets. Remember Micah 6, 8 last time, what does the Lord require of thee? To love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Hosea 6, 6. I desired mercy and not sacrifice. Again and again, Jesus points out it's the heart of God that's the issue. Well, verse 1 of chapter 6, it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields. That's actually not corn, it's wheat as we would know it, but anyway. And his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. Now it's interesting, that God, this, is, this is permissible in Deuteronomy 23. God allowed people to pick grain from a neighbor's field as they walked through, not to glean from it, not to, not to load up on it, but to, they could take what they could eat as they walked through. That was, that was the way they operated there. Verse 2, And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? The Mishnah, the commentary on the Talmud, defines 39 categories of work, and three of them are involved here. This Pharisaical, uh, the Pharisees, that was a sect that started in the days of Ezra to promote holiness, but they became very legalistic and excessively burdensome. Three of the 39 categories of work were being done here, reaping, thrashing, and winnowing. Picking the corn was technically reaping, rubbing the corn was technically thrashing, and uh, cleaning the corn off was uh, winnowing. And those were 
forms of work, and they weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath day. So they accused Jesus and his disciples, and Jesus answering them said, in verse 3, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did when he himself was hungered, and they which were with him? See, Jesus is responding to their objection by referring to 1 Samuel 21. David had approached the priests at Nob. He was fleeing as a refugee. And he approached the priests at Nob and asked for bread. He was in flight, and he and his men were actually starving. And so Jesus reminds them there in in, in verse 4, how he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him which is not lawful to eat, but for priests alone. See, it was a survival situation. That's the point. In the house of God, there was stuff they called showbread. There were 12 loaves, one for each tribe in Israel. They were laid out in the holy place. When you entered, on the left was the menorah. On the right was a table with two layers of these, uh, six each, of of these uh, showbread. That only the priests could go in there in the first place. And, of course, they were there for a, a full week, at the, at the next Shabbat, they were exchanged. Twelve loaves, one for each tribe, arranged in two rows each. And that's all in Leviticus 24, and you'll also find it described in Josephus. The loaves were replaced each Sabbath, and the priests would then eat the retired bread, was the idea. That's the normal ceremony. But here we have the king and his people, uh, his guys, uh, in flight. It was a desperate situation. It was illegal but anybody for a priest to eat the showbread normally. But Jesus is saying that nobody in Israel would criticize David. He was God's anointed. So so is Jesus God's anointed. He is claiming to be greater, at least equal, to David in this response to the Pharisees. But then he goes on. Jesus said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created at the end of the creation, by the Creator. That Creator is standing in front of them at the moment. They don't realize that. This is a bombshell. Jesus is claiming to be God. Christ and his companions were also above the man-made law, which the Pharisees proclaimed. And there's another parallel implicit in the illusion that Jesus is using. David, as God's anointed, was being hounded by the forces of a dying dynasty, the dynasty of Saul. Jesus, God's new anointed one, was being hounded by the forces of a dying dynasty also. Jesus goes on to say, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was instituted by God as a blessing. He had an enforced vacation to give people a break. God rested on the seventh day. He wanted man to rest on the seventh day. The observance of Shabbat is intended to be a celebration of the creation. It's a time of rejoicing, not an onerous time of laws and rules. The Sabbath was ordained in Genesis at the creation. It was the seventh day. And uh, the seventh day is not Sunday. It's Shabbat. It's Saturday. The Sabbath was interested in Genesis 2. And by the way, Adam, Enoch, and Noah kept the Sabbath. They weren't Jewish. The law codified the Sabbath, but it was observed before the law was given. The law was given in Exodus 20. The Sabbath was being observed conspicuously in Exodus 16, four chapters before that. Through the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath became a Jewish distinctive But even the Babylonians had a seven-day week, by the way. The Sabbath will be observed in the millennium. That may shock you. In Isaiah 66, verse 22 and 23, it describes the millennium, and that's when the Sabbath will be observed. Did you know that the temple will be closed except on new moons and Shabbat? The temple will be closed on Sunday. Did you know that? That's what Ezekiel 46, verse 1 and following, lay out. The Gospels record six instances in which Jesus confronts the Pharisees over this very issue, Shabbat. It comes up again and again. To make the case that the Sabbath is for man, he is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus relegates the Sabbath to the position of ceremonial and not moral law. Jesus has fulfilled these on our behalf in any case. 
Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Colossians, Ephesians, the whole book of Romans, the whole book of Galatians hammer this issue. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law on our behalf. We are not under the law. Jot this down. Romans 14, 5. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. So jot that down. We are not under the law. Yet the seventh day Sabbath remains a blessing for man to enjoy, even though we're not under the law, of course. One can honor the day, celebrating the creation, without taking on the Jewish legal burdens that have come to characterize this tradition. And anyone who thinks this is easy area to research hasn't studied it and is dire history. It may surprise you to know that the early church became so anti-Semitic that the church fathers went through cartwheels to try to celebrate Christian things on days other than the Jewish calendar. That's why there's such confusion about Thanksgiving. That was a thing that was batted around for centuries because they wanted a formula that wouldn't fall even accidentally on Passover. The Christians that tried to be biblical and honor the 14th of Nisan as Passover were called quadradecimans. That's Latin for 14. They were excommunicated from the church. So this issue of worshiping on Sunday because it's the day of the Lord, the resurrection of the Lord, that's fine. But part of that was a deliberate anti-Semitic move in the days of Constantine and so on. There's a whole history you need to study. People say, well, Chuck, what do you do about Sabbath? Well, Nan and I have adopted three Sabbath rules. The first is whatever we do do, we do deliberately. Secondly, whatever we do, we do together. And the third rule is there are no other rules. <laughs> But we do set it, we try to set aside Shabbat, not Sunday, Shabbat, Saturday, for a study and a meditation and a day of rest. And that works. It's interesting that for us Christians, we have two days off, Saturday and Sunday. We can serve both of them. There are many churches that have discovered this, and they prefer to worship on Friday night, because that's the most legitimate one, because Shabbat starts at sundown Friday night. And by having their church services Friday night, that leaves Saturday and Sunday clear for projects with the family and so forth. So that's turning out to be a popular option that I mentioned in passing. But let's move on to verse 6. It came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. In other words, shriveled is the point. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against them. Do you see these plotters just waiting for a trap here? Now the second contention of the Sabbath seems to be brought up purposely by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The religious leaders were observing Jesus because they were looking for a reason to accuse him. You know, the Gospels make it clear in Matthew, Mark, and John that they were seeking a cause to kill him. In in fact, Matthew 12, 4 points out They had resolved to take him, but never on a holiday. Their plan was not to do it on Passover, for heaven's sake. That'd be the worst possible time from their point of view because they were fearful of the Romans and the uprising. So their resolve was not to do it at Passover. But they didn't understand that Jesus was in charge. And he's the one that controlled the timing. That'll become clear when we get down there. Anyway, back to verse 8. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. See, so far Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. He just told him to stand up. Okay. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? Now he's got them on the spot here, doesn't he? See? By this question, he showed that refusing to do good on the Sabbath was tantamount to doing evil. And looking around upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. Now here's a visible thing. They knew he had the shriveled hand, and now he holds it up, 
and it's healed. Jesus didn't do anything. He didn't move. He didn't even say anything. He didn't just stretch forth your hand. I would show him what's going on here. This is not a subjective ailment. It was a visible, shriveled hand that was healed. Jesus performed no work on the Sabbath. He simply spoke a few words, and the hand was restored. This is the person that breathed the entire universe into being while standing here in their midst. And they were filled with madness (laughs) and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. They weren't impressed. They were just teed off, frustrated, upset. He humiliated the religious leaders and healed the man all at the same time without even breaking the Pharisees' law. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. How many times have you done that? (laughs) Wow. All night long to pray in privacy. Jesus did that, and he was the Son of God. If he felt he needed that kind of prayer for what's coming, what about us? Do we have any idea of the conflicts that we are in the middle of? Remember Ephesians 6. As you go through the armor of God, the seven elements, the seventh one is your heavy artillery, prayer. Heavy artillery. Now, he prayed all night, and we're going to discover, we can probably guess what he prayed about. He was going to pick 12. And he must have intensely prayed over each one. Jesus was not omniscient, by the way. That's an important concept here. At that time, at least, there was something that he didn't know. He didn't know the day or the hour and so forth. But in verse 13, And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose 12, whom also he named apostles. What's the difference between a disciple and apostle? A disciple is a follower. He is one that's called to learn. Apostle is a sent one. They're now getting equipped to be sent out. These 12 would minister to the 12 tribes through through eternity. They would have their names imprinted on the very architecture of heaven. They have a destiny that many people, even to this day, fail to really perceive. So apostles, they're rather apostles rather than disciples. The disciples are followers. They're, they're, they were delegated authority, the apostles were. So now we go through them. Simon, who he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother. It was Andrew that introduced Simon to Jesus. Then James and John, these are two partners that also were in the business with Peter and Andrew. And then Philip and Bartholomew. It's interesting, Peter's always listed first and Judas always last. No surprise. Some of them had two names. Bartholomew must also be Nathaniel. That's our. That's what we believe anyway. Matthew and Thomas. Now Matthew we've talked about. Thomas apparently later on goes and does his work in India. James the son of Alphaeus, Simon Consolotus, or the Zealot. Levi and Matthew, Levi and Matthew, same guy of course. Thaddeus is uh, Judas son of James. Now And they are now to be sent out as apostles They're with Jesus on a full-time basis. And he came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Wow, that covers the, the whole area. Sidon is up the coast. Tyre, just south of it, but still just north of Israel. That's where the region we think of as Lebanon today. The Sea of Galilee, of course and the Jerusalem down about the same latitude as the north end of the Dead Sea, but obviously in the hills. Now we encounter what some people call the Sermon on the Plain. It has many similarities and a few subtle differences with the Sermon on the Mount of, Je- of Matthew. The sermon recorded here in Luke from verse 17 to 49 is shorter than the version of the Sermon on the Mount that's recorded in three chapters in Matthew, chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. There are some differences. In Matthew's account, it's three chapters long. In Luke's account, it's just one chapter long. In Matthew's account, there are nine Beatitudes. In Luke's account, there's four. In Matthew's account, there are no woes mentioned. In Luke's account, it includes woes. So there's a couple of little differences. Both sermons 
are addressed to disciples, not the general public. Many people fail to catch that. They begin with Beatitudes. They conclude with some parables, and the same parables, and they have generally the same content in general. The Sermon on the Plain is Luke. The Sermon on the Mount is Matthew. There are two different views about this disparity. Some basic talk preached on two different occasions is one view. Could be. The same occasion, but recorded from two different perspectives, is another possibility. In Luke, the Jewish parts of the sermon, the interpretation of the law, are omitted because it's, it fits Luke's purpose, which is addressed to Gentiles. Matthew knew shorthand, so he took it down verbatim, apparently. Luke put it together from subsequent investigations, so we're not surprised that it's more of a summary, if you will. The sequence of events could solve the problem easily. Jesus went up in the hills near Capernaum to pray all night. He called 12 disciples to be his apostles. He then went down to a level place to talk and to heal diseases. Following that, he went up higher to get away from the crowds and teach his disciples. That's what Matthew suggests in in Matthew's account. The multitudes, they're referenced in Matthew 7 and Luke 7, climbed the mountain and heard a sermon which explains Jesus' words at the very end. Okay? That's one way one could look at this. Now let's go on to uh, verse 18. They that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, and the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. It's interesting to notice that nobody ever dies in Christ's presence. I think that's interesting. After his resurrection, he was only seen by loving eyes and touched by loving hands. We'll focus on that near in chapter 24. Jesus began his sermon with a series of blessings and woes on his listeners. The items are placed in two sets of four, four blessings and four woes, which parallel each other. Okay? Jesus focused on attitudes towards circumstances, attitudes towards people, attitudes towards ourselves, and attitudes towards God. That seems to be the structure that Luke lays out here. He emphasized four essentials for happiness. Faith in God, honesty with ourselves, love toward others, and obedience toward God. That's quite a list. Jesus lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Note he spoke to his disciples. He's speaking to his personal followers. This isn't for the general public, it's for his own. The general public may have been free to listen, but he was teaching his disciples. The term blessed, makarari, is common in the Gospels. It occurs over 30 times. All but two of the occurrences are in Matthew and Luke. Originally, Greek usage, that word described the happy estate of the gods above earthly sufferings and labors. Later, the word came to mean any positive condition a person experienced. So the word blessed fits, if you will. A formal beatitude was an acknowledgement of a fortunate state between or before God and man. And that shows up in the Psalms, of course. Poverty is a blessing. That may sound strange. Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9 is very, very insightful. Psalmist says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me food with food convenient for me, lest I be full. And deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. See, the danger of being rich and full is that you may fail to Acknowledge your dependence upon God. See, unless I deny thee and say, who is the Lord? In other words, if I'm rich, I don't need you. See, that big mistake. Now, on the other extreme, if I be poor, then I steal and take the name of my God in vain. Here's an example where we see that the third commandment has to do with your witness. Not your vocabulary, your witness. Because by stealing, you're in effect impugning the name of God. Take the name of God in vain. Anyway, moving on. Preach the good news to the poor, Isaiah says, and others. Now, they were following the one who was proclaiming his ability to bring in the kingdom. They were staking everything 
that they had on the fact that Jesus was telling the truth. They had burned their bridges, if you will. That's why Judas finally gave up and decided to sell out because it wasn't what he had bargained for. They were staking everything they had that Jesus was telling them the truth. Now, there's a challenge here to the rich. You know, we, the, we rich are constantly assaulted with the temptation to rely on riches. And there was a long time in my Christian walk, I really took my security from my balance sheet rather than walking with the Lord. That's a, that's a frank admission that uh, had to be corrected. Can we really have riches and yet not rely upon them? It's okay to have riches. Don't let the riches have you is the point. We rich are dulled to our need by our plenty. We have needs beyond the riches. Can we have plenty and still feel our need is the challenge. We rich tend to be proud of what we have done and take credit for our comforts. Ooh, watch out for that one. Can we who've achieved a lot still lead a humble life? That's a challenge. Blessed, Jesus continues, Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Psalm 42, for example, Psalm 63. Thirsting is a common theme for Christ. He does that all through, especially John. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil, for the, for the Son of Man's sake. Now, it's not because you're obnoxious. No, no, for the Son of Man's sake. Luke already mentioned twice, those who followed Jesus left everything. In cha- okay, back in chapter 5. Re- rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. And woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. See, in contrast to the disciples who had given up everything to follow Jesus. Now we get to the woes. These were the rich, the well-fed, the ones who laugh, who were popular. They did not understand the gravity of the situation which confronted them. And that's the risk of every one of us. Do each of us really understand the gravity of the situation we're in today? These refused to follow the one who could bring them into the kingdom, and therefore Jesus pronounced woes on them. These woes were the exact reversal of the temporal benefits, and they are the exact opposites of the blessings and rewards that Jesus' followers cited in Luke 6. What that really amounts to is we need to take God seriously. Consider Moses. He's quite a hero in the Old Testament. But he struck the rock at Meribah instead of speaking to it as God had told him. At Rephidim, long before, he was instructed to strike the rock, and he did. Fine. This time at Meribah, he was supposed to speak to it, and he struck it, which is what God did not tell him to do. Moses, in God's eyes, Moses rep- misrepresented God to the Israelites. He wasn't angry at the Israelites, but Moses gave them the impression God was. That's a no-no. God did not let Moses enter the land because of his heir at Meribah. He did not inherit. Here's a guy that was 40 years in Egypt, then 40 years in Midian, and had just wandered leading the entire nation for 40 years in the, in the, in the wilderness. 120 years! And he messed up at Meribah, and for that, he did not inherit his reward. He was allowed to see the land from the hill. He was not allowed. His dream was to enter the promised land, and he wasn't allowed to. God buried him at Nebo. Now, by the way, I don't think he's finished yet. I think he makes another appearance. He's going to make another appearance in this gospel, and he's going to make another appearance in Revelation 11, I believe. See, the whole point, what, Jesus, what, what God was setting up was that the two, mir- the two rocks giving off the water would have modeled the first and second coming of Christ. The first was struck, the second one was spoken, it would have been a model of the second coming. He struck the first, but not the second, so he punctured the model. Because in 1 Corinthians 10.4, the rock that followed them was Christ, idiomatically. That was the imagery that God was, was weaving here. Well, let's continue with the woes. He's woe unto you that are full. For ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Ooh, pretty tough stuff. 
But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. You know, these ideas are still radical even today. They were radical then, they're radical still. Don't tune these ideas out because they're so familiar to us. There's a risk in that. They're so familiar we don't hear them. That's why you want to ruminate them. You want to digest them. You want to go through those slowly. True righteousness. This is what Jesus demonstrated. After washing the disciples' feet, he lovingly reached out to Judas, who was set on murderous betrayal. So in John 13. And he quoted then at that time Psalm 41 9. Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Most people recognize Psalm 41 9 as a prophecy of Judas. He was actually quoting a reference to Ahithophel who betrayed David and then committed suicide. One reason Ahithophel turned on David, Ahithophel turns out to be Bathsheba's grandfather. He apparently never forgave David for what he did to Bathsheba, his granddaughter. Anyway, moving on. Who are God's enemies? It may surprise you to name one. We are. We are God's enemies. Before we're saved, the flesh is at enmity with God, and he loved us anyway, in spite of the fact that we were his enemies. How does God treat us? That's the point Paul makes in Romans 5. Romans 5, 8, 9. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Wow. Book of Romans. Precious stuff. God asks us to do what he has already done. He wants us to love our enemies. That's what he's done. God himself is the ultimate example of that's it. this is his heart. This is what he wants us to reflect his heart. Luke 6, verse 29, And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. Wow. As ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. See, agape love is always a choice, not a reflex emotion. The Greek is more precise than the English. The, the, the word agapeo is to be totally given over to something. And agape as a noun is unconditional love. Agapeo is the verb. Agape is the noun. Love is a faith choice often contrary to our emotions. And God aligns then, subsequently align our emotions with our choices, but you make your choices out of faith, and God will deal with the rest. You know, and the definitive work on this is uh, now in its probably 20th printing is my wife's book, The Way of Agape. So I encourage you to check it out. Verse 34, And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners and receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Wow. This kind of love marks one off as distinctive, unique, descriptive of the Heavenly Father. See, that's the point. Jesus wants us to reflect the heart of the Father in our actions. Be therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. See, and Jesus then taught his fathers a fundamental principle of the universe that one sows what he will reap, and that's what Galatians 6, 7, and so on hammers away. Magnanimous is a term, it actually comes from the Latin, magnus being great, and animus meaning spirit, to be great-spirited, a lofty spirit that is generous, giving, and forgiving. 
Then he continues, judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. (laughs) This is probably the most misapplied verse in the entire Bible. We are called to condemn sin. We are called to inspect fruit. What do you mean, judge not? Well, then what is this talking about here? Jesus is disallowing a judgmental, condemning disposition. That's what Frederick Godet calls the tendency to place our faculty of moral appreciation at the service of natural malignity. Or putting it more simply, judging for the pleasure of judging. Jesus is getting at the attitude. We're obviously called to make uh, judgments, but judgmentalism is merciless. It attaches motives to actions that have never been there. It always sees in the worst light. It is a sign of spiritual cancer and will itself be judged. A merciful father has merciful children. And you bear testimony to a merciful father by being a merciful child. Jesus continues, Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all, it shall be measured to you again. See, God will not be our debtor. You can't outgive God. As you give of yourself in God's name, God will He never allow him to be in your debt. You'll always outdo what you're doing. Remember the dare of God. Did you know that there is, as Jesus says, you're not to, te- not to test God. Yes, there's one place that's an exception. It's astonishing to realize that the God of the universe put himself in a box and dares you to call his bluff. And that's in Malachi 3. Will a man rob God? God says, ye have ro- yet ye have re- robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Then he challenges you here. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. That's a dare. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Wow. That's God's asking you to take on his dare. Prove me now herewith. He challenges you to do that. Jesus outlined five areas which were proof of sowing and reaping, that theme. Mercy will lead to mercy. Judgment will lead to judgment. Condemnation will lead to condemnation. Pardon will lead to pardon. Giving will lead to giving. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall not both of them fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but every one that is perfect shall be as his master, that is perfect or complete. Remember, we become like the gods we worship. That's in Psalm 158 and Psalm 135, 18. What do I mean by that? In ancient Egypt, I'll never forget this. One time we visited Egypt. We got out of Cairo. We're going along these roads. And it looked like concrete, the white riverbed kind of thing. And I realized it wasn't white riverbed. It was paper and trash. And you look more closely, they were living on uh, on dung hills. In ancient Egypt, they worshipped the scarab. What is the scarab? You buy it in jewelry stores in Egypt, a a little dung beetle. The dung beetle... Whenever there's animal feces on the road, these beetles seem to come from nowhere. They seem just to emerge all over the place. Then they're dung beetles. They live on dung. This country that once ruled the world is now living on a garbage pile. They, they, they worship the dung beetle as, the, as a symbol of creation because they seem to come from nowhere. So it becomes, of all the things they worship at the top, and so they, wor- they become like what they're worshiping. The country that, this is not a third world country, this was a country that ruled the world, is now living on a garbage pile. The world. Is the world hard, materialistic, and unforgiving? You bet. If you worship the world, you will become hard, materialistic, and unforgiving. 
Jesus. If you worship Christ, you will become like him. We can elaborate this, but you get the flavor of it. Verse 41. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy eye, nor thy brother's eye, but perceiveth not the beam, or big splinter, that is in thine own eye? See, judgmentalism is intrinsically hypocritical. Romans 2 will deal with that. It assumes that the judger isn't guilty, but behind the presumption is often a shield to his own guilt. Either, how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. See, we're not called to judge the motives of people. We're here to judge the fruit of their actions. We are called to be fruit inspectors. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Every time I come across Luke 6.45, I'm reminded of a prank that was pulled on me. A dear friend of mine by the name of Doug Wetmore was the head of Firefighters for Christ. And for many, many years, I I was busy in the business world, but I taught Monday night Bible studies at Calvary Chapel, and Doug was among those that taped those, and he would pass those tapes out, even while I was in my regular tent making business. It was just a hobby for me to do those things, but these tapes started getting circulated. Well, what I didn't know, when he edited those, he would edit them, and every time I stuttered or paused, uh, or, uh, he would take that out to clean up the tapes. But he just didn't erase it. He put it in another file. And then he published the tape of all these stumbles and misspeaking, and he labeled the tape, Luke 6.45, for of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. And it was Chuck Missler's slurs, stumbles, missteps, all collected. And he, he pulled that on me as a, as a prank. And now every time I see that verse, I'm reminded of that dear, dear friend. He, of course, uh, created Firefighters for Christ. And uh, there was a time when we left the business world to do this full time. There were already, I think, something like uh, six or eight million tapes floating around his mailing lists. And he, he, in effect, got our whole ministry started back about 20 years ago in the full-time sense. One of the important things that I've learned from, be, from my wife, actually, is that it's vital to take every thought captive. She borrows that concept from 2 Corinthians 10.5, taking every thought captive, because that's where sin begins, is the mind or in the heart. And you take it captive there before it festers or grows into something stronger and ultimately an action. You take every thought captive. And he de- she developed that thought in her second major book called Be Ye Transformed. And I encourage you to take a look at that. But it's vital. See that our, our walk with Christ is not a sawdust trail kind of thing. You go down and make a decision once. Yes, you do that to commit yourself to Christ. That Put you uh, that justifies you. From that point on, you're declared not guilty because of what Christ did on that cross 2,000 years ago. But then you're faced with the walk. And the way you succeed at your walk is to take every thought captive. It's a moment-by-moment commitment. Every moment of every day, we put Christ first. And that's the thing. It doesn't come quite away. It's something you have to learn how to do. But your step is to take every thought captive. And that's what brings about the transformation of called sanctification. See, in this case, fruit stands for what is said, not what is done. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. How should one judge when one does judge? 
Five ways. You ready for this? Humbly. Okay. <laughs> Will the most humble person here please raise their hand? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. Five ways. You, you judge humbly. You judge prayerfully. You judge biblically. That's, that requires knowledge. And judge lovingly and mercifully. How should one offer that judgment? Exemplarily. You should need to be an example. Privately, not publicly. Gently and constructively. Try that. It works. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Boy, that's the question Christ is asking. You call him Lord. Do you do what he says? Outward expression is not nearly so important as obedience. Simply obey him. It's not enough to call Jesus Lord, Lord. A believer must do what he says. Now, I want to share with you an inscription that appears on an old chapel in Germany, translated into English for us. It's quite poignant. I always think about this. I usually put it in my concluding remarks when we study the letter to Laodicea of the seven letters to seven churches. Thus speaketh Christ our Lord to us. Ye call me master and obey me not. Ye call me light and see me not. Ye call me the way and walk me not. Ye call me life and choose me not. Ye call me wise and follow me not. Ye call me fair and love me not. Ye call me rich and ask me not. Ye call me eternal and seek me not. Ye call me noble and serve me not. Ye call me gracious and trust me not. Ye call me might and honor me not. Ye call me just and fear me not. If I condemn you, blame me not. Poignant little piece, inscription on a cathedral in Lubbock, Germany. Indicts us all, doesn't it? Verse 47 in Luke 6, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. Whoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. Coming, hearing, doing. Right? You don't just read or memorize, you learn by doing, whether biking, flying, or using your Bible. You don't learn biking by memorizing a manual. You don't learn flying from just an instruction manual. (laughs) Same thing with your Bible. You have to put it into practice. The person that believes and does and so forth is, a, is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and it could not shake for it was founded upon a rock. I want to insert a footnote here. I want to remind you what's called the principle of expositional constancy, a fancy word for a very simple idea, that the Holy Spirit adopts the same idioms throughout the 66 books of the Bible. Even though 40 different penmen wrote it over a period of almost 2,000 years, the same idioms are used with a consistency that's astonishing. A stone or a rock is always idiomatically used of what? the Messiah. He was the stone which the builders rejected. He's become the headstone of the corner, the rock which the builders refused, and so forth. He's the rock upon which he's going to build his church, the belief in Christ. This guy built, his foundation was on a rock. That rock was Christ, for it was founded on a rock. Go to the next verse. He that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. 
And the ruin of that house was great. You need to be really careful on what you're building your worldview on. We all have a view. We all have a set of conceptions and preconceptions about what reality really is. You've got to make sure your worldview, your conception of reality is sound, is correct. And you're not the victims of the myths and foolishness that masquerades as false science today. It's astonishing to discover how far our science and physics concepts have drifted from reality. I don't want to derail this whole study by going down that path, except to point out much of what most people think is true is not. The more you understand the true nature of reality, the more comfortable the Bible reads from cover to cover. Well, we've just finished chapter 6. We've gone from chapter 5 to uh, 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 chapter 6. We've talked a lot about disciples. I want to add a little piece here. I'm indebted to Joe Foch for the research behind this. I'd like to talk to you about a nobody, a guy that nobody knows, a guy by the name of Edward Kimball. Interesting guy. He ran a Sunday school class, and he had a burden for one of his Sunday school students to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So he went down to see him at the shoe store where he worked. And he led him to Christ right there in his shoe store. And so he led him to Christ. You know what his name, the name of the student was? Dwight L. Moody. He was just a kid. Now that young man went on to become an evangelist whose ministry rocked two continents. Well, while preaching in the British Isles, Moody spoke in a small chapel that was pastored by a guy by the name of Frederick Brotherton Meyer. Now, in his sermon, Moody told an emotionally charged story of a Sunday school teacher he knew who personally went to every student in his class and won them to Christ. Okay? The message that Moody delivered to Meyer so changed Pastor Meyer's entire ministry it inspired him to become an evangelist. So Meyer came to America several times to preach. And in Northfield, Massachusetts, a confused young preacher sitting in the back row heard Meyer say, if you're not willing to give everything to God, are you willing to be made willing? (laughs) Well, that remark led J. Wilbur Chapman to accept the call of God on his life. Now, J. Wilbur Chapman went on to become one of the most effective evangelists of his time. Well, he had a volunteer who helped set up Chapman's crusades and learned to preach by watching him. His name was Billy Sunday. Sunday eventually took over Chapman's ministry and becoming one of the most effective evangelists of the 20th century. In the great arenas of the nation, Billy Sunday's preaching turned thousands to Christ. Inspired in 1924 by a Billy Sunday crusade in Charlotte, North Carolina, a committee of Christians committed themselves to reaching that city for Christ. So they invited Mordecai Ham to do that, to hold a series of evangelistic meetings in 1932. And in them, there was a lanky 16-year-old who, in the large crowd one evening, spellbound by the message of this white-haired preacher who seemed to be shouting and waving his long finger directly at him. And night after night, the youth attended, and finally he went forward and gave his life to Christ. What was that teenager's name? Billy Graham. So we go from a nobody down to Billy Graham. Now one of the questions we might ponder, can anything like that happen today? Are there some of you hearing this that God's call is on your life to be whatever. It may not be evangelist. It may be the teacher. It may be whatever you feel God's calling you. But let me tell you something. What God begins, he finishes. If his call is on you, my urging is that you respond. See, without him, we can't. But without us, he won't. You have to, it's your move. So what can you do? I'm going to suggest that every one of us are a work in progress, me included. 
all of us need to raise the bar on our personal walk. We all have a need for further growth. One of the best ways to do that is to start a small group. You don't have to be a teacher to lead a group. You invite some friends over to review and discuss a DVD with some coffee and cookies. The Holy Spirit will take over. All you need to do is facilitate it. Make sure one person doesn't dominate. Make sure everybody gets an opportunity to participate. And it will become infectious. You don't have to be a teacher. Only a facilitator. Workbooks and leader's guide, all that kind of stuff is amply available from many places. University course credit can be accrued while you're doing all of this. Therefore, Jesus says, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. We can spend a lot of time expressing why we think the time is short. You look at the global horizon. The more you know about what's going on in the world, and the more you know your Bible, you can see the convergence taking place. Time is short. You want to do all that you can for the coming king. You want to be ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Okay, next time, we're going to go into chapter 7. Four unique responses in Capernaum that are worth our study. So for the next session, I want you to study Luke chapter 7, and I want you to contrast the responses of four people. Respond to faith, to despair, to doubt, and to love. Four responses. Check them out. And let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we praise you for who you are. We thank you for this evening, and we thank you for these impacting teachings. Father, we pray that through your Spirit, you would help us appropriate these to our own lives, that we each might be more effective, that we each might grow, that we each will raise the bar on our personal walks that we each would discern and then respond to that calling you have for each one of us. We indeed are willing to be made willing to give all for you. We thank you, Father, for this time. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We pray that you would shield, protect, heal, encourage, and equip us as we commit ourselves without any reservations whatsoever into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, our coming King. Amen. You've been listening to 6640, the ministry outreach of Koinonia House and Koinonia Institute. Today's Bible teacher was Dr. Chuck Missler, teaching through the gospel according to Luke. For a complete listing of resources available, please visit khouse.org. You can also call us at 1-800-K-HOUSE-1. To learn more about Koinonia Institute, visit koinoniainstitute.org. Thank you for listening to 6640 and for your continued prayerful support of this ministry. Until next time, as we continue this series, may God bless you with the knowledge of His Son, Jesus Christ, as you study His Word.